Hey, Coach. Um, you know, obviously, record-wise, it was a bit of a tumultuous season. But when you look back at your first year, is there anything you're necessarily proud of in terms of your performance as a coach? Oh, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot I'm proud of. Um, there is the very first of all, like the getting through it and um, the growth of the players individually, the um, kind of experiences that I went through that I'll learn and grow from, the relationships that I built with not just the players, but Rafael and Tillman and our performance team and my assistant coaches um, to come out of the season that we had and regardless of the wins and losses and, and that and still be super excited, super um, hopeful for the future is not very often in this in this league, it doesn't happen very often in this league when you uh, lose as much as we did this season and still be super optimistic about what we have coming ahead is a very good feeling. So yeah, there's a lot that I'm taking, a lot positive that I'm taking from this season. There's negative as well. I mean, the losing and um, I'm always gonna be self-critical about things I could have done better, but overall, yeah, I'm just, I'm just excited about the group. I'm excited about the organization and I'm excited about the future. Appreciate it, Coach. Yep. Adam Spolin. Rafael, with the production that you got from Christian playing so much for towards the end of the year, does that kind of change the, the way that you feel like you can build the roster around him? Um, I, I don't know if it changes it. I, I'd say it... Um, uh, it confirms the hope we had uh, that that he's a multi-positional player um, and uh, and a really skilled basketball player. We, I mean, we kind of knew those things, um, but it is it's confirmation that that you're not an all pigeonholed with him, um, and that he can be a productive player. He's just a good basketball player. So he plays both ends. Uh, he plays inside out. Uh, he's a walking bucket. So like, yeah, Christian can play. So. Um, it, you know, I guess piggybacking off what Coach said, he, for sure one of the really encouraging things this year was how well Christian played. Simona Lee. Uh, Rafael, I know at this point this upcoming pick swap kind of is what it is, but how much does your long-term planning change based on whether or not you keep that pick? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I was scooting my chair over. <laughs> Um, yeah, like I, I know the pick swap kind of is what it is at this point, but how much does your planning change best based on whether or not you keep that pick? I, I mean, uh, presumably the player we pick will, will change pretty dramatically depending upon where we end up. Uh, I think that's the case for everybody in the NBA um, uh, who's in the lottery. Um, but um, yeah, so, but otherwise not really. Like we're, we're trying to, gather really, really talented basketball players and, and, and put them together and grow them. And, you know, kind of that process started for us this year and we'll, we'll continue it next year. So I, I think, you know, obviously the, the guy we pick will probably be different depending upon what pick we're at. Um, but, um, but other than that, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're pretty locked into to a strategy of really trying to grow a team that can win a championship. Mark Berman. Rafael, along those lines, what are what do you what could you say? Tell us, or generally speaking, or some of your priorities for this offseason? Get a more talented group that that Stephen can win a championship with. Like, I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it makes sense to like predetermine, especially not in May, um, who we're going to draft in July and and who we're going to try and pursue in free agency in August. I think. Um, I just, I, I think that we will be flexible, adaptable, and aggressive to try and find the most talented guys we can find. And I guess getting back to the first question I was asked, I think that um, it definitely is helpful that we have guys who, you know, we presume will be here for a while, like Christian, 
um, and uh, Scoot and JT uh, and KJ and Eric uh, and John, all these guys are like versatile and they can defend multiple positions and they can both shoot and attack closeouts. And so we kind of, you know, it's not, we're not pigeonholed into what types of players I think we, we bring in. And so the result is we want really, really talented guys um, so that we can be as competitive as quickly as possible. Jonathan Fagan. Um, we've got, you mentioned quite a few young guys. You've got three first round picks. Does it make sense in rebuilding to also have your 30 somethings along with the minutes you want to give to the three first round picks to the Kevin Martin Jr. Uh, or KJ Martin, Kevin Porter Jr. and so on? I mean, this is actually a good question for Coach a little bit, but my answer, and I'm going to answer it in the but for sure, yes. Like, you know, you want people to build good habits and you want people to, uh, um, to learn from real pros. And so I, I definitely think that, um, I mean, Eric Gordon is like a consummate professional basketball player. So like, how can it not be helpful to practice alongside him every day? That, go watch Eric shoot. That's, that's what shooting is supposed to look like, right? And so if you're not seeing it every day, how would you know? And, and so I, I don't, I, I know some teams have done like wholesale rebuilds where they just go extraordinarily young, but um, I think that's largely built around the premise that they're also trying to lose. Um, and I, I, you know, I've said this before, I think one of the advantages to the various moves we made this year is that we do have a lot of future draft picks um, that are unprotected that aren't just ours. And so I think it gives us the luxury of trying to be, be competitive and grow our young guys and have 30 something guys. And, and the fact that they might help us win a game or two extra or five or six games extra is not, is not something that we're worried about. Where I think sometimes when teams are rebuilding, they're very strategically trying not to win. And, and so uh, we're trying to compete. Um, and, um, you know, we're not going to shortcut the process and, you know, we're trying to win a championship ultimately. Uh, and there is a, there, there is a build to that, but, but that's what we're trying to do. Hold on just a second. We're, we're dealing with something here. <laughs> <laughs> we can't hear are we good to go yeah he, great <laughs> cody davis hey mr stone um what is the process and at the same time what is the possibility of flipping some of these future draft picks that you guys have for a more established player um especially with within this upcoming off season I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think we are going to do what we think is the best thing for the group and the team every time. Um, I, you know, for sure, draft picks are, are at least as valuable as trade assets as they are as picks. So I would never say we wouldn't trade any pick, let alone all our picks. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons we accumulate them is because they're the currency of the NBA. Um, but I don't, yeah, it's sitting here right now, I have no idea whether it, that's going to make sense uh, this offseason and, you know, whether we would do something small or large or anything else. I just, I, I, at this time, there's just no way to know. And not something we would want to predetermine. Brian Barefield. Where did your keen eye of being able to spot talent come from? Because you added some really good players to this roster this year. Uh, I thank you. That's very, that's very kind. <laughs> I hope you're as kind when we add a couple who, who don't work out quite as well. Um, I think, you know, I think, I think, you know, we're all an accumulation of our experiences. And for the last few years, we, the Rockets haven't had draft picks. And one of the things that I've been very focused on for the last five or six years was how to get, 
how to bring in very talented players who could be contrib- who could contribute to kind of at the time an elite winning team without a draft pick. And so we, you know, um, uh, like even like a guy like Daniel House who's on our team is somebody that we as a group found several years ago and was very impactful for us and is still a good contributing member of the team. So I think that. It's, you know, practice makes perfect or whatever. So I, I might have, I have a lot of experience as does our group on trying to find guys and really paying attention to people that we can think can be successful um, who maybe aren't, aren't on the typical path. And that's something we've had to be good at for the last, for the last few years. And, and it's been more challenging in the past to find opportunity for those guys to play than it was this year. I mean, one of the things this year was we, we, we were just so challenged with injuries that everybody who could walk got an opportunity to play. And, and that's, that's unusual in the NBA and, and a credit to the guys we brought in, that they were ready. They played, they played really, really, really hard and they gave themselves a chance. And, and I'm very proud of them and their effort. And I'm super proud of coach Silas um, and the job he and his staff did with like no practice time of getting, of being able to put the guys in a position to have success. Uh, um, it's like, that, that's real too. Like, you know, like not, not trying to teach somebody, you know, the, you know, reinvent the wheel every time somebody comes in, allowing them the freedom to play and to be successful is not something that every coach can do. And coach Silas did a great job in that respect. Jason Bristol. Steven, because there were so many guys that were added to this team, um, can you tell me what the process was like? Were you working with players that perhaps you had only seen on video or going with guys that maybe the front office only gave you a little bit of, uh, of a scouting report? Was that how it, it played out at times or, or was it nothing like that? No, it was very much like that. <laughs> we didn't have time for videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had guys who we brought in and uh, I would have to like, YouTube videos on them and Rafael would tell me who the guy was and basically what he could do. And then I'd watch and then they'd play 30 minutes <laughs> that night. It was just a crazy year. You know, it's just crazy with the injuries that we had and the game after game after game with no practice and using shoot arounds to introduce guys to each other and introduce groups of guys to what we're doing on both ends of the floor. Um, and the style of play that we have is a kind of easy way for guys to play to their strengths. And Rafael, as one of the earlier questions alluded to, did a great job of bringing guys in who could step in and play and play well and uh, play hard and um, kind of just push forward the culture that we're trying to put in place as far as multi-positional guys who can do a lot of different things, but play super hard and buy in and are very much about doing things the right way. So um, as hard as it was having guy come in X guy come in after X guy, um, it, it was good for us because we got to see these guys in against the best teams in the NBA as the last part of the season went through and we were playing every great team in the NBA. We saw them fight and play and saw some good things and saw some things that we can build from. So yeah, it was like difficult as far as trying to get guys organized in that part. But overall, I think if you look at it, kind of uh, you take a step back and you just see how hard they played down the stretch. It was it was a good thing. Thank you. Mark Medina. Hey, Mark Medina here, USA Today. Good to see you guys. Um, I was wondering, what are your overall takeaways of John Wall this season with just how he's navigated a bunch of different things the, the performances he had helping the young guys and the injuries. And what do you think that presence will mean moving forward? Yeah. I mean, John was really good for us. I mean, think about where he came from, right? He was 
injured for two years and nobody knew if he was going to be able to even play at all. And he came in and he had success. He worked himself beyond the point that he probably should have as far as the nagging injuries that he had were just based on him wanting to play more. And, and now nah, coach, leave me in, I'm, I'm good. Or, okay, we have a back-to-back. -back. I haven't been playing back-to-backs, but I'm playing this one because we got a chance to win. And uh, those are the things that made John super um, impactful for our team and just the amount of pride that I have <laughs> based on what he did coming back from that injury is, is immeasurable because <laughs> we had a bunch of guys like that early in the season who were coming back from major injuries, but he worked himself back all the way back to leading us to victories, to um, playing more minutes than he probably should have to the point where, you know, his body kind of gave up on him at the end and not to the point where he's not going to be able to come back next year and, and be great. But um, that's just, who he is, he's gonna just fight through and, and uh, do whatever he can to make it good for the group. You don't, just to add on, you don't know players really until you work with them. Like, you just don't. You might say hi, you might see him at a restaurant, but you, it's very hard to know anybody, right? Unless, and, unless you spend real time with them, you get to know him. John's been like awesome. He's, his IQ is through the roof. And he's just a good dude. And so I think for this group, he's he's been great. And for me, he's been great. And like, yeah, he's just, John's a really, really good guy. That's that's what I would say. And he, you know, and he does, and, he, and he's a hooper, John Balls, right? So like, you know, he, you know, like it was the plan to start the year to, to coach's point was he wasn't going to play back to backs. And then like, I look up and I'm like, wait, he played last night. And this is a back to back. And he's just playing. And, um, you know, and you can't help but love that about him. Like, so yeah, I, I think he, I, I do think coming back from where he came back from, he had a really successful season. And I think he's, he's poised to be materially better next year. I know we talked to him, we met with him yesterday and, and he's fired up. Like he's, he's, he's already plotted it out. Um, and just, and again, just, I, I don't know what's going on, but like his basketball IQ is so high. Like John does get basketball. It's, it's, it's really fun just, just hanging out and talking to him. Kelly Eco. Um, this is for you know who, who, who wants to answer this, but do you think the development of guys like Tate, Martin, KPJ, you, do you think that was kind of accelerated because of the season that you guys had, and how much of that carries over to a normal year when there's practice time and and there's no injuries or less injuries? <laughs> sure. Uh, no, for sure. Like, I mean, uh, for like KJ, he's a guy who, I, I mean, I obviously, I was super excited about KJ. We, we did a bunch of stuff on draft night to acquire him, but we didn't plan on him playing this year. Like he was playing high school kids. <laughs> and so, um, so the, the, the fact that he got, the way the year shook out, he got an opportunity to play, not just like a little bit, but like he played monster minutes down the stretch and was successful. Like, was efficient like that those things don't happen with 19 20 year old guys so i think it was absolutely great for him um uh scoops a guy who played in the nba last year and was successful last year and uh, i think the big thing with him was just the positional change um which you know we got the opportunity to, to kind of try that out in the g league first which i think he liked and it fit him and so he was able to do that with us but i you know i mean scoop was going to play when we when we made the decision to acquire him, we, we knew he was going to play a little bit, um, and, and I think you know Tate was was a guy who was ready to play in the NBA, so he was going to play um, for both Scoot and Tate. Maybe not as much as they ended up playing, but um, but for sure those guys were going to play. And I do think that there's no substitute for NBA basketball games. So they're all for all three of those guys. Their development has, has should have be, should be, and I think will be accelerated by just the sheer number of, of reps they've gotten this year. I think overall, that's a really good thing. Terrence Harris. 
Hey, this question, hey, Raphael, how, how's it going, guys? Good. I want to ask you a specific question. Um, when you look at the, the this young core players that you have, and you got a chance to watch them all, all season, when you look at them and, and you look at and you're starting to look at maybe who you may acquire either through the draft or free agency, are what are the specific skill sets do you feel like you need to add to this group, to this young core of players that can help them excel? Yeah, I mean, I think I just think we just need we need more guys like like them and 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 just we just need we we need we need talented basketball players. We need we need really good basketball players. We have some and and I think some of the guys we have have a have a real opportunity to get better over the offseason. Um, what one thing that I was hoping we would get at the stretch, which we did not get, was I was hoping we would get enough help to really get a sense for what the team looked like intact. And we never got that. So um, you know, so but it, it probably wouldn't have changed anything for me anyway, or for us collectively. We're we're just gonna try and bring in the best guys we can, whether that's through free agency or the draft. I just think you find the best basketball players you can and make it fit. Like we do, we have really, really versatile players. Like we've, we've believed in that for a long time. That's kind of where small ball came from a couple of years ago. And, um, and so we have a lot of guys who play a lot of positions and do a lot of different things, including our, our, our larger players like Kelly and, uh, and C Wood can handle like, you know, so we have, we have multi-positional multi-dimensional guys. And so, one of the advantages of that is if you can find a good basketball player to play with them, they can work it out. They can play together. Good basketball players can play with each other. So like that just, that's, that just is. And so I, I don't, I don't think we're pigeonholed into what type of player we find. Ben DeBose. Rafael, you guys have made no secret about the fact that many of your future draft assets might be for trade purposes rather than actually you guys making all of those picks. I'm sure there's some that hear that and they say that while it sounds good, they wonder just how attractive the franchise is to sort of the established marquee player tier coming off a bad year. Um, how do you respond to that? What's your sales pitch, if you will, to people around the league for why this is a franchise where star players can and will win at a high level? Because we can and have won at a high level for the last <laughs> years. <laughs> like, you know, uh, it's fair. You know, like, so, and, and, and I would say, you know, like when I go around the NBA, like nobody talks, I mean, part of this is because they're being nice to me, but no one says like, you guys are horrible this year. They say, Oh my God, I've never seen a team take injuries like we took this year. That that's you know, that's my sense from talking to others around the league, is I don't think there's a perception that there's something wrong with us at all. It's just we just took brutal injuries. Um, you know, and I would say, like, you know, um, we we traded for Kelly at the trade deadline. And I mean, yeah, I think he loved his time here. We certainly loved him, and I, I think he really enjoyed it here. I, I think, yeah, I don't. I, I think, you know, I, I think the reality is, is that Houston's like an amazing city that, that is well known in the NBA. It's, it's, it's a destination city in the NBA. And, um, and, you know, I'm hopeful that people end up, I, I'm positive that everybody in the NBA likes Steven. And, and, I'm, and I'm hopeful that people like, you know, for the most part, like me. And so I, I think that this is a really attractive destination. I, I think, you know, um, now having said that, you know, again, we're, we're really committed to really building something that gives us a chance to win a championship. So we're not, we're not just packaging a bunch of picks to try and, you know, to try and barely make the playoffs for a year or two. That's, that's not the goal. We're, we're really trying to build something sustainable and, and with players who can be good now and great later. Um, that, that, that's for sure the goal, but, but I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not actually concerned about about people wanting to be here. I, I, I'm, I'm confident that, that we're going to have people who really, really, who really, really want to be here. Adam Spolin. Steven, how, how do you feel you can best assist Rafael and his team during the draft and free agent process? <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm just gonna be uh, uh, someone to bounce things off of, someone who will pay attention, someone who'll be in as much of an expert on the guys who we're kind of talking about as possible. But I think 
as you've seen, Rafael has a great eye for talent and what fits and all of those things. So my job is basically not to mess that up <laughs> and allow him to, you know, evaluate, pick guys who he thinks fits. And we are very aligned as far as our, how we see basketball. So yeah, I, I, I'll be involved, but like, he's done it already, right? Like you see the guys that we've gotten, we've got Christian Wood and Jay Sean Tate and KJ Martin, like all these guys, Armani Brooks and Kyrie Thomas, like all these guys who nobody really kind of was on besides him, right? So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be there and, and listening and, and giving my opinion, but I'm totally, I just trust him. That's all. Saman Ali. Saman, you're muted. I don't know. Okay, does that work? There you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah, uh, Steven, you've had one year under your belt with uh, Kevin Porter Jr. and KJ Martin. What have you thought of their seasons individually, and where would you advise them to improve? Yeah, so with Scoop, the as Rafael said earlier, the position change was huge. And putting the ball in his hands and uh, having him go down to the bubble and work with Mahmoud and work with the team and play a bunch of minutes at the point and explore his game and the strengths that he has that haven't necessarily been tapped into. That was like everything for him. And then coming to the team and the fact that we play a similar style to what he was doing in the bubble and the fact that he knew when, as Rafael said, when he came back, we were going to play him and give him an opportunity to um, play to his strengths and learn and grow and all of those things. And he did a good job. And it's not an easy thing to come into an NBA team, especially midway through the season, but to be a point guard when you've never been a point guard in the NBA before. And to do it at the level that he did it is really just a good thing for him as well as the group. And the guys like playing with him and he made other guys better on the floor. I think you saw with his ball handling, he can get to where he wants to get on, get to on the floor with his passing and his size, he can find guys. And as evidenced by the Milwaukee game, he can score, <laughs> he had 50. So uh, des definitely encouraged by kind of the growth and the path that he took from where he was at the beginning of the season to where he was yesterday when we were in our meeting. And uh, he's great. Uh, KJ Martin, <laughs> very similar, just from where he was at the beginning as a, as a guy in training camp with the deer and headlights look and, and was just trying to kind of make it through to playing 40 plus minutes in games and coming up with a highlight block every game and shooting threes as confidently as he was and just the growth and improvement that he made in the bubble and then coming back and establishing himself as someone who um, should be in the rotation. And that wasn't given to him at all. And both guys earned what they got and they got more because of the injuries, obviously, but um, they proved both proven through hard work, through ups and downs, through, you know, the typical NBA stuff for a young guy that they persevered and really um, kind of established themselves and gave themselves kind of a launching pad moving forward as far as their confidence and what they know will succeed in the NBA, but also uh, what they know won't necessarily succeed for them. And th those are two big ones, especially the part of what doesn't succeed. We'll take three more, Jerome Solomon. Yeah, well, stop 
Raphael, and good morning, guys. Um, I mean, historically, the move from the bottom to the top, as you alluded to several times, is it, rarely accomplished in, in short order. So with, with where you guys are, with all of the assets you have and draft picks, et cetera, coming up, how does your process, for lack of a better term, compare uh, to the ones from the last 10, 15, 20 years that have taken forever and have never succeeded? <laughs> I hope to go quicker and succeed more. Um, <laughs> I think keep hope alive. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think you know. Um, yeah, like I, I again, I think one thing is is that some of the teams embarked on a conscious or semi-conscious or intentional or whatever um, uh, design to th their 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 primary asset that they were that they were banking on was being bad themselves to get high picks. And with the lottery system, you know, just like we're looking at right now, you, you, that might take years, right? Like, because you may not hit the lottery ball. And so even if you're the worst team or one of the worst three or four teams, you might pick fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth. That's just, that's the way our, our game is set up. And so, uh, so some teams I think have kind of intentionally tried to, to give themselves a long runway to hit lottery balls multiple times and, and their primary asset was their own draft pick which would which means that they had to kind of intentionally be bad for a while uh, or for years on end i think um you know w one of the results of the various transactions we've done is that we do we sit on a lot of picks that aren't our own and so um and so at least the possibility exists that um that we can, you know, that those will end up being high picks. And so I think the result is that we feel a little, uh, we, we're, we're kind of abandoning the strategy of just of intentionally trying to be bad for five to 10 years or whatever it takes. Uh, we're not trying to do that. I, I think that's the biggest difference. We're, we're trying to compete. We're gonna be young. Um, uh, we're, not, we're not trying to like press it immediately, which I think is, has also been good. I think the teams that do that sometimes make quick mistakes because you might bring in a free agent pay them a lot of money that isn't kind of quite the guy just because that's the guy that's available in that year and we're going to try and avoid those types of mistakes like we're not going to be perfect not every transaction is going to work out um, um, whether because of fit or injury or whatever else but um, but we're going to do the best we can we're going to you know we're going to try and put a competitive product on on the court quicker and we're not we're not worried that that we need our draft pick to be as bad as possible or as low as possible in any given year because we do we, we do have some other picks that 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 we expect will come to us in the future. Also, right. to, Thanks a lot. To piggyback on that, I, I think this year was very much a function of like the injuries and the the other stuff. Like if we would have had our full group for the whole season, then we probably wouldn't be, you know talking about any of this, right? <laughs> We'd be, uh, we, we would have had our full group and we would have won more games and all of that stuff, so. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's impossible to know where we end up, where, where we end up and we never got, post trade deadline, we never got our full group even close to healthy, but but we did, you know, after, after kind of the initial series of transactions, we were still a really, really competitive team. Um, but again, yeah, in injuries did it, and and we're trying to grow, and so we didn't react to injuries the way a top one team would have, which was like toss in future picks to try and get somebody to hedge a month, right? We didn't we didn't do this, you know. And by the way, I should give Stephen credit for perseverance and patience because that's frustrating when you're the coach and your GM is like, yeah, good luck, <laughs> just ride it out, huh? yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, you know, that was, that was this year, uh, you know, and uh, I think if we weren't willing to, to, to make changes this year when we really needed them, if we were willing to kind of play the long game, we'll, we'll do that in the future too. But I, 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 you know, our working expectation is not that we're going to be the most injured team in history every single, every single year. I'm, 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 we're going to bet against that and see where we can go. Thanks a lot. Adam Wexler. Appreciate your time this morning. Uh, Steven, you'd mentioned Mahmoud earlier on, on how much he helped with the development of some of your guys, along with him and, and Robbie and John and, and your coaching staff in general, Jeff, et cetera. Can you share some insight on how much they helped those young guys, both on and off the court the out, throughout the season, and, and maybe what their status is uh, moving forward, these coaches? 
Yeah, so I mean, they've all been super helpful. Mahmoud, the job that he did with the G League team was, I mean, under the circumstances where it was the bubble, first of all, and they had limited practice time, and as organized as he is, as positive as he is, but he's also like a very good tactician when it comes to, you know, offense and, and getting the guys to play the right way. And that's what we needed for KP and for KJ when they went down there. So the job that he did with the G League team was like exactly what we needed at that time to set those guys up to play and play big minutes and um, to succeed when they came to us. So the job that he did was great. And John Lucas is the best at what he does. He's the best in the world at what he does as far as connecting with players, um, making them better. Um, the like detail part of an individual's game. He can look at somebody and just know what they need as far as their shot or their ball handling or whatever. But there's also the, <laughs> the skill of getting to a player that not everybody has and connecting and um, building trust and all of those things. And he is like, I have never seen anybody do it the way that he does. And it's so effective in, in that part of it. And for me, he was great. He's coming to my office and tell it like it is. And, and that's what you need from your assistant coaches. And then, you know, Will Weaver and Sagana Jopp and Rick Higgins were great with the game plans and, and also watching film with players and connecting with those guys. And you mentioned Robbie, who does a great job with Luke. And he really worked with KJ Martin on his shot a bunch this season. And it, you can't deny the improvement of our of our individual players. You just can't. So yeah, I love my staff. I hope to have all of them back next season. And uh, yeah, they, they should be definitely proud of the work that they've done uh, with the group. Last question, Jonathan Fagan. Rafael, you sort of hinted at this a little bit, but you've got nine or 10 guys under contract, uh, depending on one of your decisions. Uh, three first round picks. So you're up to like 13 guys before you sign any of your own free agents or go out there. How, how does that impact your goals in free agency, what you want to get done and how you want to use that mid-level exception? Um, yeah, I mean, our, yeah, we have, we have some roster, I guess, positional stuff, but like we have, we have, I mean, it is, it's super weird because you, you, you normally, when you have a team that had a record like ours, you can be like, the team has no talent, but, but we do have talented basketball players. And so uh, we have guys that other teams want. Um, and, um, and so th there are things we can do if we need to create a roster spot. Um, um, but also like, you know, we want to just bring in good basketball players. They need to be like, even in, even in mid-level, we only have one mid-level exception. So sometimes you divvy that up. Um, but, but other times you just try and go find a single guy and that would, you know, that obviously that person could be impactful and helpful. Um, so which one is it for you? I don't know yet. Like it's mid, it's mid May. Like <laughs> I don't even know who's going to be a free agent. Guys are still extension eligible. And like, I just don't know, you know, um, I think, you know, I'll promise you what I, I think I've, I've been good. On, we had more players play for us this year than anybody's ever had before. I promise I'd be aggressive. I promise I'll be aggressive. Right. But, uh, but in terms of the who, you know, you just don't know. Uh, Scoot is a great example. I like he would have been really super high on my list of guys that I would have tried to get in a situation like this. But I had no concept that he would be available until a week before we got him. And so you just you just don't know. Um, and uh, again, I actually think it's a bit of a mistake to try and predetermine it. So I, I think we'll we will do our homework on literally everyone. I, I promise you we'll be aggressive and I promise we won't be outworked. We will do our homework on everyone. And then we, you know, we'll try and we'll try and make it work and, and uh, you know, and we'll do the best we can. Who's going to the lottery? 
I, I don't, I actually don't know that, like truly don't know that either. I, mean, I haven't, I haven't had the opportunity to talk to, to Tillman uh, about that at all. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I hope it's not me, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. Who's lucky? Yeah, we, I would, I would say probably not me at this point. <laughs> not me, based on our injuries this season, it's not me. <laughs>